and they share the mic. And then the yeah, so they had to be quarantined. No, no.
Hi, good evening, everyone. Thank you for being here with us tonight. Welcome. I'm Karen Lim, curator of Baba House. And tonight is our second part series of thoughts organized at the NUS Baba House. First of all, I want to thank our two inspiring speakers for tonight. And they are Ms. Lee Chor Lin and Dr. Courtney Fu for their time and inputs that they're gonna to give tonight. And for the team at Baba House, Daniel, Jen, and Crystal for organizing and coordinating and the back support for this virtual event. And to all our Zoom audience, thank you and welcome. This evening discussion is presented in conjunction with the exhibition Groceries of Straight Chinese Homemaking. Where well, we're gonna see some of the slides. So, it is my honor to welcome Chorlin and Courtney as our panel for tonight. Each of them will speak for 20 minutes, followed by a Q&A session from the audience. Well, Chorlin is no stranger in the museum industry. She started her museum career in 1985 as a curator of Southeast Asian collection at the National Museum Singapore on Southeast Asian textiles and a straight Chinese dress. A former senior curator at the ACM in 1993 to 2003. She was also involved in the Sun Yat Sen National Memorial Hall, Malay Heritage Center, and a former director at the National Museum for 10 years. Chorlin has published widely. Some of her publications on textiles and fashion include Batik, Creating an Identity, Sacred Threads, Ceremonial Textiles of Southeast Asia, Power of Dressing, textiles for rulers and priests, and then Chon Sam and Sarong Kabaya contributions in the birth encyclopedia of world dress and fashion for South Asia and Southeast Asia. And Chorlin right now is covering, currently working on her second book on Batik. We have uh, Courtney with us. She's a research fellow at the NUS Faculty of Arts and Sciences, a historian of late imperial and modern China, with a focus on sartorial culture and fashion history. She has published fashion studies journals, including Ming Studies and Fashion Theory. Her latest article on Noya fashion is included in Rethinking Fashion Globalization Available, which is coming in August this year. She has recently been awarded the NHB Research Grant for a project titled Fashion Shows and Fashion Media, identifying and documenting Singapore fashion heritage. So this evening, Cholin and Courtney will both reunite conversations on historical and curatorial perspectives on fashion, the construction of identity, and also the museum's role. So without further ado, let's welcome Cholin to start the session. Thank you very much, uh, Karen. Uh, thank you very much for inviting me uh, to, to talk about um, fashion, community, uh, and identity. And, and you, you had wanted me to focus on uh, presenting fashion uh, in, in museums. So uh, I will largely draw on my experience working as a curator uh, from National Museum. Uh, to Asian Civilizations Museum and back to National <laughs> Museum. So anyway, uh, I, I started my career, like, like you said, in 1985. And uh, when I started, I was thrown right into the deep end uh, with the Southeast Asian collection at the National Museum. And uh, it was very rich in Southeast Asian uh, textiles. So especially uh, uh, the, the examples from Indonesia. By and large, the, um, in, in Southeast Asia, uh, the, the, the textile production was subsistent and, the, uh, and it was a, a central uh, activity to the rhythm of life uh, in many Southeast Asian communities. The techniques and pattern making were always passed down from mothers to daughters. And so the patterns are worn within the, the family or the lineage uh, or the community. So, so therefore, 
uh, you you are uh, uh, what you wear uh, in in many parts of, of Southeast Asia, and so it's a good place to start to um, really explore the um, relationship between personal identity and and what you wear uh, with Southeast Asian textiles. Um, once I get over the PTSD uh, caused by, you know, the intricacies of what's warp and what is weft, the supplementary weft and warp, and the different types of uh, weaving and, and dyeing uh, 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 techniques, um, the, the world uh, of Southeast Asian textiles and Southeast Asia was really open to, to, to me. Um, and slowly with, with, these, with the understanding of the Southeast Asian textiles, I was able to, to build a, a map, you know, of, of a recognition with, with textiles. Um, I, I slowly, you know, uh, uh, found a way to zone Southeast Asian uh, country, uh, countries and the islands into the, the Ikat zone or the weft Ikat zone. So here you, you have um, a warp Ikat technique uh, used by two different ethnic groups. And, and in fact, many of the ethnic groups in Eastern uh, side of Southeast Asian islands use this technique quite often. So uh, here I have two examples, one by, uh, on, on the left-hand side by the Iban of Sarawak and thousands of miles away in the highlands of Sulawesi, the Toraja people use the same technique to, to weave these fantastical, um, um, beautiful and, and rich in colored uh, uh, ceremonial textiles. Um, likewise, you could also create a, a weft ikat zone with um, uh, uh, weft ikat techniques, uh, uh, but woven using silk and on slightly larger looms. And two examples, again, there are two people who are quite far apart. On the left-hand side, you have the uh, panong worn by the Khmer people, in, uh, woven by the Khmer courts. And similarly, uh, about 100 years ago, uh, perhaps more than that, in the court of Palembang, you have weavers using the same technique to weave beautiful ceremonial textiles. And in this case, it's a five meter long uh, shoulder cloth. And I, I think it is still the world's longest uh, uh, silk weft ikat uh, shoulder cloth of this kind in, in the world. And, and they're all in the National Museum. And um, the supplementary web weaving is, is so versatile that you could tell, you could see that even on the island of Sumatra, which is very large, but uh, the same technique could produce very different uh, uh, visual effect, like the long ship cloth at the bottom of the slide, uh, woven by the Lampong people, the southern end of Sumatra, but just less than 500 kilometers away up north, a bit inland, um, using just metallic threads and a mixture of silk and color, you have a completely different feel. One is very figurative and almost uh, na uh, um, narrative and the sort of stories they're about to tell. Uh, it, it can only be, you know, like told by the people in Lampong, whereas the people uh, further up north, you, 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 you see more geometric patterns but using the same techniques. So again, you know, it, for me, I think this is a really fantastic way of understanding Southeast Asia and um, navigating through the different uh, cultures and, and backgrounds of, of the uh, highly diversifying uh, uh, cultures in Southeast Asia. So the writing on Southeast Asian textiles and fashion, uh, as well as world textiles and, and world fashion, is really rich. Uh, but I just want to focus on a, a few of the books which um, are seminal, I think to me, are quite seminal. And they, 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 they shape the way uh, I approach textiles and they shape the way I conceptualize um, my curating on textiles. Uh, Marty Balkitinja, which is the brown book with the girl on the swing, uh, Splendid Symbols, published in 1979, is still, I would recommend as the te basic textbook to beginners. Um, the colorful one, Batik Fable Cloth of Java, is to me still one of the best uh, presentation of Batik's 
um, e even even though it was published in 1984. Um, the uh, author, Inga McCabe Elliott, was herself a textile designer. And uh, together with the book designer, and the, the really uh, quite brave and, and generous, uh, and they're, they're not uh, stingy at all in presenting uh, the textiles, the batiks, over uh, double spread um, and full bleed so that the, the, the readers could really immerse in the beauty of the, of the, of the cloth. And all the contextual uh, photographs are, are printed uh, strictly in black and white so, so as to um, enhance the, the aesthetic experience and enjoyment of the, of the textiles. So I, I'm, I'm deeply influenced by, by this book so that um, by uh, uh, 1991, when I published, when I wrote and published the uh, book Batik Creating Identity, um, this formula of colorful, full bleed batik uh, with uh, black and white pictures, this formula is really uh, replicated successfully, uh, very much thanks to the, the richness of the batik collection in the National Museum, as well as the very talented field photographer that we had Tara Sosrowadoyo, who did a wonderful job with the all the field photography. And um, the other book that I thought I should really uh, um, um, highlight is this uh, seminal work by Shen Chongwen uh, called Zhongguo Gudai Fu Shi Yanjiu, uh, on a completely different subject. It's a study of ancient Chinese dress. Shen Chongwen was already a very famous um, novelist before the war but he was badly, badly uh, persecuted during the Cultural Revolution. He was banned from writing fictions, but he was banished to the Palace Museum. Well, what Chinese literature lost, uh, we, uh, the art historians and the museums, gained immensely from this magna opus. Um, in, in this work, Shen Tongwen used textual uh, uh, evidence, textual references and match these textile garment uh, descriptions with pictorial images from paintings, from murals, um, as well as uh, archaeological finds. So truly, uh, uh, the, the description of the garments were for the first time, I think, matched together uh, with images. And he, he also um, talked about uh, lifestyles and the activities of, of the different uh, social uh, classes in, in China. So, so that he gave room to um, the readers, so much room to imagine how the wearers would wear the garments, how the garments would move with the wearers you know, conducting the activities. And it truly, it is a, a, a fantastic uh, book. It's a heavy. Uh, it's it's um, very rich and it's 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 very uh, uh, deep and and really functional as a as a fantastic reference to Chinese uh, dress history. Now I was really sad to leave the uh, uh, the Southeast Asian textile collection from the Asian civilizations in. Uh, museum in 2002, but you know, well, what can you do? They gave me an offer that I couldn't refuse. So, um, but I, I carried with me all the approaches and, and the knowledge I accumulated at the Asian Civilizations Museum to the National Museum of Singapore. The mandate I had as a director of the National Museum of Singapore was to uh, make a Singapore history exciting, uh, to make it accessible to many people, especially uh, the young people. Um, in other words, in short, to sex it up, you know, to sex up Singapore history um, for, for the nation. And I, I think the only way one could do that really is to, um, to, 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 to save it from the hijack of constitutional history and the national state narrative and put it back to the people who in the first place created history. So um, the, the fortunate thing is that the Singapore History Collection is full of uh, daily objects. It's rich uh, in daily objects, including lots of textiles and garments. 
um, and tons and tons and tons of photographs. So with these materials, you, you organize them, you put them together, you get a really different view, a really different uh, idea uh, and perception about Singapore history. And, and so um, uh, you could almost use it as an entry point to the Singapore history. And that's how the fashion gallery in the National Museum of Singapore was built in 2003. It's really based on the strength of the Singapore history collection. So it was this fashion gallery just about fashion of, uh, uh, in, in the museum. Um, I, 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 I must say, um, I beg to differ. It is really about the um, it's really about the history of uh, Singapore women, um, how they became the force of economy uh, during the early days of our nation building. Uh, it's about them stepping out into the world uh, from domesticity and uh, making choices, redefining herself and uh, with her choices of clothes. So we were not uh, keen to just display them, all their clothes. Um, we uh, uh, pulled in uh, materials like oral history and music um, and, and uh, moving images just to liven up. This is just to give people, our audiences, a real uh, experience of, of what fashion actually meant to this uh, a group, a large group of our population. Really, it's an homage to our grandmothers and, and mothers, movie stars and, and rubber factory workers and police women and nurses. Um, it's really about the aspirations as, as well as um, frustrations, you, you could say. Um, in, in curating, I think the most important thing that the curator has to do is to explain, is to educate um, its audiences. So in the fashion gallery, um, our job is not just to pay homage to, to the Singapore women, but our job is really also to demystify fashion. You know, this, this, uh, uh, this discipline is full of allure, full of, of, of um, uh, uh, celebrities and hype. Um, in the back room of the fashion gallery, this is where you would see how fashion was made. So with the display of seamstresses uh, tools, sewing machines and the noises they make, uh, fabric samples, what's cotton, what's polyester, uh, what's linen and what's cotton mix, you know, that they're all on display for you to touch and feel. Uh, we, we pulled out pattern samples and templates used by seamstresses and tailors just to help people understand how the process of, of fashion making was. And I think the most uh, remarkable uh, uh, achievement that we made in this backroom of the fashion gallery was this little video clip we made on how to wear a sari featuring an Indian lady uh, dressing the sari from almost a, a half undressed state. I think it was a truly brave um, uh, lady who uh, allowed us to film her doing that. So um, the fashion gallery was um, in effect a, a sort of platform for the museum to engage with uh, many different sectors of our audiences. And sure, and true, uh, uh, sure enough, uh, we, we feel that it is one of the most popular uh, galleries in the whole museum. And we could tell because donations were, were coming in quite frequently. So uh, it's, it's, it's truly a, a nice place uh, to have that, that we have built. Um, and, and so I think uh, we, we felt that we're really stirring up a more sort of meaningful and active interest in, in fashion. And so we, we started to look around uh, and, and take reference from, uh, from different sources and inspirations from different sources, not just researchers and students of fashion, but also practitioners. Um, so these these are some of the uh, things we we uh, you know we use constantly as sources of inspiration, but mind you, you know, curating fashion uh, in the first decade of the century was no is really not easy at all. Um, but by 2011, uh, I think our collection and our research 
uh, were coming uh, in, in, a, in a culmination that we could pull together a show, a big show on Chong Sam, like the one uh, we pulled together in 2012. Um, so in the mood for uh, Chong Sam was cu curated uh, to show uh, a series of, of Chong Sam. I think visually is spectacular and uh, it definitely generated a lot of love and interest uh, in, in what we're doing. So, and personally, I think from a curatorial point of view, it is very, an important exhibition. It's a milestone exhibition for two main reasons. Number one, I think this um, exhibition is important in the sense that we were able to stretch the timeline of Chong Sam all the way to its golden Shanghai period. Just before we were uh, signing off on our exhibition design, um, uh, a precious donation came in with fantastic examples from the Shanghai period in great condition that we were able to insert them in this exhibition. We are able to, put, to stretch it all the way to the Shanghai period, but also pull, push it through uh, the 50s and 60s uh, by borrowing pieces from celebrity uh, of Hong Kong and the leading lady of Hong Kong movies in the 1950s, Lin Dai, as well as uh, international uh, designers like Christian Dior, uh, Alexander McQueen, uh, the Taiwanese designer, uh, Xia Zi, Chen Xia Zi, and all these examples were all pulled in one linear line to show almost like the beginning to the present day of Chong Sam. The second thing I think uh, make this uh, exhibition uh, very important is the fact that the exhibition situates uh, Singapore in the, um, the, the narrative of Chong Sam. And uh, particularly, Singapore, uh, Chong Sam is featured in that blank period of between 1949 and 1978. And um, with the Singapore Chong Sam, we were able to tease out all the intricate nuances of the Chinese milieu outside China. And uh, the breakthrough of this exhibition is, is the successful insertion of uh, Singapore into the global narrative and the global timeline of Chong Sam and breaking the conventional monopoly of Taiwan and Hong Kong uh, for, for, for that matter. But most of all, uh, once again, it is an exhibition about the women in Singapore, um, our first ladies. Um, we have a beautiful display of all the Chong Sams by our first ladies. Um, it's about all the white collared uh, working uh, women in Singapore, your typists, your teachers, dance hostesses, songstresses, as well as um, the seamstresses, tailors, the wearers, and the makers of Chong Sam. So I think it helped us define all these play people and all these players um, of Chong Sam uh, in, in a very special period. Um, in the global history of fashion. So I think I'll stop there. I'm sure there are lots we can talk about, um, but uh, it, 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 my, my short introduction, uh, I hope will be just fodder for more interesting conversations and dialogues later on. Thank you, Charlin. Yeah. Thank you so much for sharing with us the introducing to us on Southeast Asian textiles and presenting to us how the women's role in nation building and in Singapore history with the choices they made on their fashion. Yeah. And also we are also having a, a, a visual experience on looking, looking at the exhibitions that you have been involved in at the National Museum. On, especially in this, uh, in the mood of Chong Sam, understanding the players behind Chong Sam making as an identity ma uh, maker, and also understanding the um, how Chong Sam is situated, situating Singapore in the uh, in the narrative of Chong Sam, yeah, throughout uh, history itself. So we want to thank you for that sharing. Let us just um, have Courtney to share with us her 
her um, expertise on the Noya Kabaya that she's been working on. Thanks, Courtney. Um, thank you, Karen. Uh, uh, thank you for inviting me to this panel. And uh, Charlene, that was a fascinating presentation. I'm so sad that uh, the fashion gallery is no longer there. Um, all right, okay, so um, my presentation uh, focuses mainly on the Nunas and also the intersection between fashion and identity construction. Um, I will make references to Victoria Catoni's video, Nunas Kabaya and Baba's Desire, which is uh, installed here in this Baba house. Uh, and my presentation will also make connections to the global trend of heritage preservation and also provide some historical evidence to show the fluid nature of the identities and how fashion comes into the play. So without further ado, uh, let me begin with an observation of the current resurgence of interest in the Peranakan culture. So, um, I'm not sure how many in the audience today had a chance to watch Katoni's video um, that shows how varying the kabaya makes women feel. Um, but to me, it is uh, very telling that her work zooms in on this one single particular outfit, which is the kabaya. Um, a very obvious but often overlooked question is, of all the dresses historically associated with the Nunas, why is the kabaya being treated as the costume for the Nunas and almost exclusively so? So I think to many, this may not even constitute a question because people may wonder, well, if not for the kabaya, then, um, then what? Of course, the sarong kabaya is the ethnic costume um, for the Peranakan uh, women, the same way the chongsang or the qi pao uh, is for the Chinese and the sari is for the Indians. But I'm asking this uh, often overlooked question and try to find out what's behind this current elevation of the kabaya outfit. So I think uh, if you look at the slide, uh, we all agree that there's this ongoing revival of interest um, in the Peranakan culture, which, um, which seems to have reached a crescendo in the year 2008. Uh, it was the year when both the Peranakan Museum and also our Baba House here were both founded. Uh, and also in the year 2008, um, this Mandarin TV drama called uh, Xiao Niang Zhe or the Little Nyonya became quite a media sensation and it even achieved a phenomenal success even in um, the overseas Mandarin speaking markets. So in terms of publications, uh, I'm sorry for this wordy slide, but these are basically uh, a tally of uh, the publications on um, Nyonya dress and accessories. So there's this, um, there has been this boom uh, on books related to Peranakan material culture. And uh, if you look at this tally of the publications on Nyonya dress and accessories, um, we can look, we can, if you look at the year of publication, um, somehow the momentum seems to have picked that speed from around the year 2008 as well. So I'm not sure if the cursor works, but um, this is the, the year of publication, which I highlighted in yellow. All right. So if we look at the titles of the books, we can also see that um, the books on Nunya dress from also roughly the second decade of the 21st century also invariably centered on the kabaya with uh, very often with the qualifier, um, the Nunya being added before it except for Peter Lee's book, uh, which is called The Saran Kabaya, Peranakan Fashion in an Interconnected World, which is published in uh, 2014. Um, that's a bit bad. All right. Oh, sorry. Um, so most of these publications are actually coffee table books. They are richly illustrated on glossy paper and they're basically targeting at a popular readership. 
Uh, we can also sometimes find these books being displayed in souvenir shops or even museum shops along with the Peranakan themed merchandise. So um, I think this is quite understandable from a marketing point of view, as we all agree that um, the feminine figure of Nunez in Sarang Kabaya, who is capable of producing very exquisite embroidery and also the bit work, and also sometimes, you know, serving this exotic uh, fusion cuisine, um, makes it a very powerful marketing tool um, to attract both the local audiences and also the foreign tourists alike. But we may wa also want to ask what's behind this almost singular and also a disproportionate emphasis of the Peranakan culture. And what is also being lost in this current rejuvenation process? How are we to make sense of this resurgence of interest in the Peranakan culture in the 21st century? So let me begin from the individual level. Um, and there's this lady in Katoni's video whose remarks um, struck me in particular. She's of course very proud to be a Nyonya and uh, she feels very special when she wears the kabaya, which is of course, you know, quite a, a common sentiment shared by um, several ladies in the video as well. However, she actually also considers the Nunyas in Sarang Kabaya to be actually above the other Chinese ladies. Um, and here I quote her. You can see class being displayed in the way they did their embroidery, they beat their shoes and purses, their customs, their language, their behavior, all have to be very polite and well-mannered. They sat properly with their sarongs, unlike certain Chinese who wore pants, which allow them to squat. The Nyonyas don't do that. Um, so I hope the audience here had the chance to watch the video. It's quite interesting. Um, so I think by pants, um, this lady is referring to the samples, which um, I'm sure the Nyonyas wore as well in the past. And it is also clear from um, the other ladies in Katoni's video that not all the Nunyas actually wore the kabaya in their household. So the question then we may want to ask is that what actually explains this classist attitude, which I think is not uncommon, um, um, but it is actually very few people are actually uh, willing to openly talk about it, at least not as openly as um, this lady here in Katoni's video. So, um, okay, I would um, interpret this, um, um, this reappreciation of the Peranakan culture to be part of this global phenomenon. It is a response and also a counter reaction to the homogenizing effects of globalization, which on many levels is synonymous with westernization. So the other part of my, uh, another area of my research actually deals with China. And we know that in China, um, the enthusiasm from both the state level and also from the ground up level um, over tangible and also intangible heritage spills over to the fashion and cultural creative industries as well. Um, and scholars also take this to be part of this global phenomenon of preserving the indigenous cultures, least they uh, be swallowed by the insatiable appetite of the market economy. Um, here in Singapore, we, um, our Peranakan heritage is celebrated as a national treasure that serves to testify our vibrant multicultural and also our cosmopolitan past. So visiting the Peranakan museums, tasting Peranakan cuisine, and uh, dressed symbolically in the sarongs and kabayas, this Baba Nunya culture is or has been uh, molded into a powerful marketing tool for our national branding, and uh, I believe contributes significantly to this booming heritage tourism. However, I would also like to point out that in this reappraisal of the Peranakan heritage, um, certain elements are given disproportionate emphasis and put under the spotlight uh, much more than the less savory 
or even the more controversial parts, which are then pushed back to the background. So at the institu institutional level, um, the museums and also the Peranakan associations here in Singapore and also in Malaysia had a part to play in putting forth a highly essentialized and also a romanticized um, cultural heritage for public consumption. Um, the feminine and also the domestic aspects constitute the mainstay in museum collection and of the dresses, the sarang kebaya is undoubtedly given the most emphasis to the extent of almost claiming it to be exclusively Peranakan. Um, so also, if we go to um, the activities organized by the Peranakan associations, we often find them to be um, functions of um, colorful displays of sarang kebayas and also the batik shirts. And we also find their members um, you know, making this conscious effort of addressing one another as Baba so and so, and also Nyonya so and so. So this makes it a very classic example of how a single outfit is essentialized and also becomes an identity marker. Um, so I've just outlined um, an analysis of the phenomenon from the individual level to the global level. And uh, Singapore is certainly not uh, alone in being allegedly engaged in some level of self-orientalism and also self-exoticism. Um, right, okay. So I think for the rest of my presentation, um, I will provide some examples, some historical evidence to argue um, against this aesthetic ethno-cultural conceptualization of Nunya's dress and to show how identity is vulnerable and um, is vulnerable to manipulation, constant reinterpretation, and also in essence, fluid and ambiguous, especially for a hybrid community like the Peranakans. So for those who are familiar with history, we know that the Baba leaders launched a strict Chinese reform around the turn of the 20th century. This was in response to a combination of several factors ranging from geopolitics in the region to the exponential influx of new Chinese immigrants who were then called the Sin case um, or new guests. Um, I do not have time to go into the details, but with regard to the Nunyas and their dressing sense, a Baba leader had this to, see, to say. Uh, we should encourage our girls in every possible way to give up the Malay language and revert to the Chinese tongue. We should also strongly recommend our young maidens to return to the Chinese style of dress and coiffure. No one possessing a keen appreciation of the beautiful will ever hesitate to make a choice between the Malayan sarong and baju with the co committant slippers and the dainty silk garments of China and with their variety of tasteful colors and attractive cuts. Um, so besides this evidence, this textual evidence, um, there are a lot many other uh, instances also in the Streets Chinese magazine, which is uh, basically the mouthpiece of the uh, Streets Chinese reform uh, and also in elsewhere that the Baba leaders um, express their concerns over the so-called undesirable uh, behavior of their women folk, such as gambling and also better not lip chewing, uh, among some other bad habits, which the Baba leaders deemed as an affront to the community and also a hindrance to, the pro to their progress. So, Educating the Nunas was then one of the major social reform agendas. And uh, from this passage, we clearly know that uh, what they meant by education was really synthesization, or to be more precise, re at least in terms of dress um, and also in language.
All right, so um, due to the time limitation, I think I would just like to show one more example, uh, which is an excerpt from the Singapore Free Press and Mercantile Advertiser in 1938. Um, I'm sorry for the small print. I'll just read, um, read out the underlined passages. Um, okay, so dress and fashions pointed to a steady decline in the use of um, the sarong and kabaya among street-spawned Chinese women. Chinese women were beginning to realize how lacking in grace and beautiful um, and beauty, sorry, was the native wear compared to the jacket and trousers, which I believe it is, is the sample, um, or the Shanghai gown, which is an, an earlier name for the Chongsam or the Qipao. And today, only a few women, most of them elderly, could be seen in the attire of the Malays. While many still use the sarong in place of pajamas, it was becoming unsuited to modern living conditions and the general preference for the jacket and trousers, both as indoor and outdoor wear, was proof that the Malayan mode um, has long been regarded as out of date. Um, I'm sorry, the last uh, sentence is cut off, um, but clearly, the sarang kabaya went through a period of decline in the early decades of the 20th century, and this was in conjunction with the social reforms advocated by the community leaders. And also the community was then uh, increasingly under the influence of popular culture from the West and also from Shanghai, which then consequently made um, the Western frogs and also the Chinese tea pao more fashionable compared to the native wear. Um, so as a consequence, the, uh, the indigenous sarongs, kabayas, and also the baju panjang then went out of fashion and were deemed less suitable for mimure than being modern and also keeping up with the times were then very much in the air than wanting to project a tropically exotic um, and also a folklorically traditional look. So, um, so we want to ask then why a hundred years later in the 21st century, the kabayas get all the attention. Why when the historic wardrobe of the Nunas um, as diverse as consisting all these multiple styles ranging from Baju Panjang to Baju Shanghai and also to the Chinese fashions, um, is now is the Sarang Kabaya now given the almost singular emphasis in this new wave of cultural rejuvenation. Um, so by way of conclusion, my presentation calls for attention to the highly versatile and malleable nature of the Peranaka identity and shows um, and also how dress comes into the play in the formulation of identities past and present. Um, the fact that the Sarong Kabaya is not specific to the Nunas alone has been highlighted by our honorary guest curator Peter Lee in many of his writings. Um, so the Saran Kabaya is, is actually a pan archipelago outfit donned by multiple Southeast Asian communities, both native and foreign, uh, residential and sojourn, all of whom played a role in the evolution of the style. So the Saran Kabaya therefore cannot be restricted by uh, national borders or even by cultural or ethnic borders because there has been simply no true um, or, or pure Peranakan costume to begin with. So the forge of a new identity and also consequently um, a new satoral practice is always then a result of a combination of different compelling factors of the times. Um, so um, my last point then would be um, the relative decline of the Saran Kabaya uh, in conjunction with the ascendancy of Chinese fashion a century ago was the result of a deliberate suppression of the native Malayan identity 
While this current reappreciation of the kabaya arises out of the need for distinction and also for a salient identity in a world that is increasingly getting smaller and similar, then jeans and t-shirts uh, have become this universal satara language and fast fashion detects our wardrobe. Um, so I think my last point would be that um, so um, that um, we have to actually practice um, some form of uh, self-reflexivity here and ask ourselves that in the process of preserving our culture, um, have we actually um, at the same time reinforcing this colonial East-West binary thinking and also locks our Peranakan culture in, an perpetual, in a perpetual uh, effeminate persona of the Nunas in Sarang Kabaya. So I hope um, I'm doing fine on time. Um, I think I'll stop here. And um, okay, all right, thank you. Thank you, Courtney. Thank you so much, Courtney, for presenting to us the Noya Kabaya, which is used as a global trend of heritage conservation and also showing us the resurgence of interest in Pranakan culture since 2008. Um, you've also shown us that looking at the Noya Kabaya outfit as an identity maker, which is in past and present, and how it epitomized tradition, culture, and national identity at an individual level and also ties to global, national, and institutional levels. So we, we thank you for that um, interesting perspective. And maybe we can open up to our audience for a question and answer session right now. Okay, we have a question here. It says, it was interesting to see a lot of research and commentary on fashion as being related to gender issues as well, with women particularly being under the spotlight. How influential was dress informing men's identities? Hmm. Maybe, maybe I can get Courtney to have you, in your research, have you actually touched on this area? Um, right, okay. So is the mic working? Is the mic working? Okay. All right. Um, okay, so this is an interesting question. How influential was dress in forming men's identities? Um, okay, so I'm not sure if uh, this question, this audience is asking uh, as in, you know, men in general or the babas in particular. Um, but if we talk about the babas, which is, you know, uh, basically my research for the past two years, um, there's this gender divide between uh, the babas uh, dressing uh, satara practice and also the, the nunas uh, satara practice. And this actually goes back to uh, actually uh, their identity issues because the babas had always been identified uh, more as uh, ethnic Chinese and they've always been uh, dressed in the Chinese attire um, uh, in the public. So I think uh, there, there are actually some visual evidence of the babas dressed in uh, sarongs in the, the, the comfort of their domestic um, household, but uh, when they're projecting a public persona, they always project a, a, a Chinese identity. Whereas the Nyonyas is very interesting. Um, the Nyonyas had always been dressed in the indigenous Southeast Asian uh, outfit, and it was um, basically uh, as a result of this uh, social cultural reform at the turn of the 20th century that the identity becomes an issue for the Nunas. Um, so to answer this question, um, I think the, the men or the Babas, um, the dress had less of an impact on the Babas and their formation, formulation of their identities as compared to their women folk. All right, so in and also if we go back to, uh, if we talk about the museum collections, I think uh, most of the museum collections are basically uh, 
the the fem the female uh the 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 nunas uh dresses and garments and accessories and we do not have actually too much uh, of the men's wear or the men's attire so i think that also becomes a question uh, when we talk about you know projecting you know the baba's satoro practice in history all right i hope that answers the question <laughs> Right. Thank you. Thank you, Connie. Yes. What about uh, Cholin? Do you have a, a perspective in, in this area? Maybe you can share with us. Um, I, I think in uh, the research, uh, my own research and also uh, the research that we conducted and the presentations that we've done on fashion, in the past 30 years have been uh, geared towards the women's uh, fashion, simply because the collection is full of women's uh, materials and very little on men's, um, that's one. But I, I think also it's inevitable because if you look at the history of Singapore, um, w women really burst onto the scene right after independence uh, because they, they had to all come out to work and they became a very important economic force. Uh, and so it's a very interesting topic to, to talk about um, women entering the workforce, women contributing to the society and the economy of, of Singapore. And the, but fashion was a very interesting entry point to, to talk about them. And certainly it was sexy you know to, to talk about fashion and and women's role in the in the in the whole context of singapore history um i i think we could readdress that imbalance of course uh although i would just add to what connie just said i think perhaps uh men especially the the baba and uh, many of the uh, uh, working men of the 20th century would probably prefer to adopt a, a conformity appro approach towards how they would present themselves in, in the world. Uh, although it is, it is an overgeneralization. I mean, there's so much of men's fashion that you could, you could uh, uh, cull, right? Uh, and from the books that I've shown, uh, one of them that influenced me so much was the history of men's fashion. And, and it's, it's wide, it's, it's highly varied. Uh, I think the basic point is everybody dresses uh, to, to define uh, oneself, uh, especially when, when, when you're confronted by the outside world. You know, it, it is a way of asserting yourself, it's a way of communicating uh, your, your thoughts, and your status, um, as as well as the the, the context of, of you know your being to to the world. So I, I think the imbalance uh, that we see in the museum presentation is unfortunate, and so I I, I hope in in moving forward uh, the our curators uh, will will you know try to pluck the gap. <laughs> So um, just um, to add Great. on to that, I think um, uh, during my research, I actually came across that um, there has been a small exhibition, uh, I think here in the Baba House some years ago, uh, on dressing the Babas, um, if I remember correctly. <laughs> if the, if the uh, right, okay. Yeah, so I think that was some, some years ago and that uh, exhibition was basically done um, using some donations from, uh, I think, the previous owner of this Baba house, if, if I'm not wrong. Yeah, okay. So also, so that's basically, uh, you know, an act of uh, redressing this imbalance of the museum exhibitions. Yes, great. Thank you. Thank you, Courtney and Chaolin, for the inputs. Um, well, there's another question for Chaolin. It says, uh, thank you for the interesting presentation. Chaolin, could you explain a bit more about the multi-sensory experience in fashion? Um, I, t I take it to mean uh, the presentation in the form of exhibitions and museum displays. Then I, I would like to refer uh, heavily uh, back to the fashion gallery in the National Museum between 2003 and 2015. Um, in, in order to, to immerse our audiences uh, in the world 
of, of fashion that's spotted by uh, women of the 1950s and 60s and 70s of Singapore. Um, obviously, we displayed uh, different styles of dressing in the showcases. But if you notice, we also um, went deep into uh, the, the little uh, daily routines and rituals that they would do, the makeup, hairdo, handbags, and to give a total uh, contextual, uh, the total context um, that, that would go with the dresses. Um, the other thing that we tried very much, uh, very hard to do was to insert uh, a, an ambience into the, the gallery by um, creating uh, uh, different stations where audiences could listen to oral history. Um, there was also uh, even one uh, station that uh, you could hear all the pop songs, or well, a selection of the most popular pop songs that one would hear in the 60s and 70s. So um, I, I think the sound and moving images uh, really created and co helped conjure up uh, the movements and the feeling of, of the time, um, of the spatial dimension of um, uh, what the uh, women in, in the 50s and 60s would, would personally, physically experience. So that, that constituted the, the sort of multisensory uh, um, experience that we're trying to conjure up for, for the audiences. There's definitely no lack of moving images. We, we pulled uh, and, and edited and pulled together so much um, film, uh, film footages from newsreels, from films that it, it, um, some, uh, some comments for the gallery was that they thought it was like a film uh, museum rather than a fashion uh, gallery. So, so I think perhaps at that level we might have achieved, and we might have achieved in helping uh, in in all ways and dimensions uh, the audiences in in experiencing uh, the sartorial uh, uh, um, feeling uh, and and milieu um, of the time. I'm actually quite curious. Um, yeah, just to just to ask you this question because, you know, from your study on textiles, right? Um, the tactile quality of a textile is pretty important, and I think when just now you were sharing about you know certain um, designs and the way it's weaved, it's by different groups, and it also represents a different hierarchy in that society. So when the person who asked this question, I mean, my, my curiosity, it's, um, it's a bit more about multi-sensory experience in fashion. Was the tactile aspect of it also very important in, in, in textile to understand the identity maker, as an identity maker? When you look at textiles and you touch them and then you can actually tell the history and the identity behind it. Does that make sense? I mean, that because it's it. uh, it's all we were always situated in a museum context, and which uh, of which the number one golden rule is no touching. Uh, but I think we compensated that with the back room, uh, where we we displayed uh, the different kinds of fabric uh, materials. Uh, there was a whole template of the different sorts of materials that uh, we encouraged people to touch and feel and to learn uh, about you know, the, the tactile uh, qualities of the different types of uh, yarns that would create. Um, I, but I think for the Southeast Asian textiles, the visuality of the textiles themselves would already tell you um, the feel uh, of the cloth. And certainly, uh, if you looked at the Iban Pua, and the uh, Toraja Purilongjong in my first slide, uh, if you see them physically in real, in reality, they're huge. The uh, Toraja cloth was, was uh, eight meters long, you know, the Pua was slightly smaller, but they're all woven with hand spun, homegrown cotton. So they have a very rough kind of texture, even seeing them uh, across, uh, 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 from the glass showcases, you could feel. And um, physically, they're, they're, they're big and heavy. 
And if you look at the weft ikad of the Khmer court and the Palembang court, immediately you feel it's finer, the, the patterns are thinner, simply because I think the, the, the silks are uh, finely uh, uh, spun. So I think the physicality and the visuality of the textiles would compensate uh, for uh, the fact that you couldn't touch them. Of course, I think um, it's it's better to to feel them, but I I think in in textiles it's it's not so uh, ultimately essential uh, in in the in the learning. You know, uh, maybe draping it and seeing how it would move with the body is more important, and that's why we uh, are very you know keen on moving images because that's when you could see how the textiles behave with the human body and, and the movements. Thank you. Thanks, Charlin. There's another question just from the first one. It says, how do you then envision the future for Singapore museums when it comes to curating shows on local fashion? I, I will get you to share and then maybe for Courtney to add on because Courtney is working on your uh, research, which also at the end will amount to an exhibition. Yeah. I think. <laughs> so maybe, Cholin, would you continue with that? Just a question on envisioning the future for Singapore museums when it comes to curating shows on local fashion. So if we see fashion as an entry point to understanding uh, uh, the history, or we, we, we see fashion as an expression of creation, then it's very much like how museums uh, uh, deal with the art scene. Um, every uh, fashion designer in Singapore working uh, uh, fashion designer deserves a, a space, deserves a, an attention. Uh, they need to be documented, their work, uh, their, their journey of creativity. Um, and if we see fashion as a way to explain the way of life of Singapore and to explain uh, identity of Singapore, then it's, it's just uh, um, a focus uh, for, for curators uh, to pick on and a theme uh, for curators to use to, to question and to explore different issues in our society. Mm. So it shouldn't be seen in or, or curated in isolation. It should be, uh, I, I really encourage curators to take a much more holistic approach and right. use it as one of the tools uh, to, to explain things. Yeah, right, yeah. What about you, Charlin? I mean, what about you, Courtney? <laughs> right. Your perspective on this question. Yeah, I would uh, really love to see fashion feature more uh, or increasing more uh, prominently in the museum exhibitions. That's why I, I really, you know, wonder why um, has the fashion gallery um, stopped existing in the national, was it in the National Museum? Yeah, I would really love to see more fashion um, to be, you know, put on display. And as uh, Charlie just mentioned, because uh, fashion uh, is really not an island, it's a response and it's a response to, uh, you know, this whole milieu and all the, all the combi a combination of the social cultural factors of the times. So through fashion, it can tell us a lot about, you know, um, the people, the nation, and also the community. So uh, in terms of my research, um, I've been working on reconstructing um, the fashion history of uh, Singapore. And when I tell people that, you know, this is what I work on, you know, the first response would be, oh, is there a fashion history in Singapore? Or is there even a fashion industry? So I think um, this, is a, this is a project that has a lot of potential. Uh, and uh, I'm very glad that um, I, um, I, me and also my PI, the team, uh, we are awarded with uh, this uh, National Heritage Board Research Grant to work on uh, two research uh, or investigative sites of the fashion history, which is the fashion show and fashion media. And uh, as I was just talking to Karen uh, just now over dinner, um, that um, right now our research deal, uh, deals mainly with uh, the textual and also the visual materials. Uh, we would, of course, uh, love to collaborate more with um, the museum sector and get the, the uh, the tangible 
uh, artifacts uh, in terms of garments and also accessories uh, to be part of uh, our, uh, our database building and also this uh, collaborative effort of reconstructing the fashion history and eventually as you just mentioned uh, we really love to see that you know this would uh, ultimately result in a uh, exhibition that actually brings our research results in a very visible and possible manner to uh, to the public yeah. yes thank you thank you sure. um there is a question i think it probably addressing to you courtney is it uh, are there advantages for Babas to project as Chinese? Like, does it help with their social standing or their businesses? If so, how did their dressing affect that? Any thoughts on that? Right, this goes back to the history <laughs> uh, of, uh, of the community. Um, right, uh, I think... The Baba's community has uh, had always been occupying this more privileged uh, position in uh, the local society in mediating between the colonial masters who, uh, who, who speak English and also the local community who spoke you know, a variety of dialects and also Malay. So, um, so I think the, the identity of the Baba's are uh, quite versatile in actually switching coasts are right, switching cultural codes. So when it comes to, uh, you know, attending uh, functions organized by the European colonizers, they will dress up, you know, in this very impeccable uh, Western suits, you know. Uh, whereas when they're dealing with, you know, the Taoists <laughs> and you know the local Chinese skills and clan members, um, they will dress in, you know, the they dress in the, tra the the very traditional Chinese uh, uh, long uh, long robe and also the ma gua. So in that sense, um, in that sense, their 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 satara practice is tied back to their versatility of their identities, which then actually uh, you know uh, makes them actually more navigatable. Uh, in the society and uh, also maintaining their stat uh, their privileged status. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Sure. Um, we have a, to both panelists, we have another question. Will you say that the design in fashion involving the forms you mentioned has changed in contemporary times to suit current tastes? What are the pros and cons of that and how do we avoid essentialism? This will be the last question. So let me repeat the question again. Would you say that the design in fashion involving the forms you mentioned has changed in contemporary times to suit current tastes? What are the pros and cons of that and how do we avoid essentialism? Charlene, you any any perspective from your side? Um uh, if we're referring to fashion designers, I think they're the most adaptable uh, artists uh, in 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 the in the in the world of, of art, um, and uh, I think they're the most flexible in terms of how they draw inspirations and how they uh, uh, refer. They take uh, reference from all dimensions and all directions. Uh, so, of course, I think uh, many of our fashion designers uh, and the global uh, fashion designers operating in, in, in the global uh, fashion scene um, have always been able to tailor their uh, creations uh, to the needs of to current needs, to uh, current preferences, uh, taste, uh, they're the most sensitive, you know, of, of, of all. So um, we can't really uh, dictate what they do. Uh, we could only hope that uh, they take more uh, from inspirations, from perhaps the uh, traditional uh, and the classical that uh, we curators have hold on to uh, so dearly. Uh, but uh, again, you know, uh, the fashion is about uh, the second skin that you put on yourself. And it's about 
uh, the com the comfort level that individual uh, wearers would would would, would go uh, to to spot them on. Uh, so it it is it is a constant you know ongoing negotiation uh, between the aspiration and the functionality uh, of uh, of the piece of garment. Um, we, can we uh, avoid essentialism? I, th I think we essentialize everything uh, all the time. And uh, it is, uh, I think, a, a very interesting intellectual issue, but it may not necessarily augur all that well in the uh, creative process uh, for, uh, for fashion creating and fashion design. Courtney, um, any okay. last thoughts on this? <laughs> um, right. How do we avoid essentialism? Um, I think we all have a part to play. Uh, this is uh, so the fact that um, you know this one particular single outfit is essentialized is actually, as I mentioned in my presentation, you know the, at the institutional level and also the individual level, you know everybody had a part to play <laughs> in essentializing and also romanticize this um, this you know identity marker. Um, but I, what I I I like to point out uh, in my presentation is that. Uh, is um is that this is actually a result of this uh, selective and also a reductionist approach um, that runs the danger of reducing this highly complex um, and also constantly evolving Peranakan culture to something that is uh, static and also something that locks in a timeless past. So that's basically the meaning of essentialism, right? Because this culture, especially given um, you know, this hybrid Peranakan culture is highly complex and constantly evolves with the time. But the museums and our institutions, um, you know, uh, when, you know, adopting this highly romanticized and also a reductionist approach, basically, you know, reduce it to something that's, you know, something that's essential. So I think it's very hard to avoid, but one way maybe to, to address it is to basically um, you know, deep, deep, really deep, uh, to go really deep into history and try to, uh, you know, adopt a more globalist approach um, that, you know, look at the garments and look at, you know, the Peranakan culture as really part of this whole maritime, uh, multicultural, multi-ethnic uh, uh, history in which Singapore is part of. Mm. Um, so, so I think, um, you know, something that I didn't mention uh, in my presentation is that, you know, this, this whole museumization process um, also engenders, uh, you know, the impression of authenticity. But authenticity is something that is very, a very slippery concept. It's, it's also, you know, the same as traditional or, or tradition, which are also very constructed concepts and you constantly um, you know, in dialogue with the present. Um, so that's why, you know, when I think of oh, the question is gone, but, <laughs> but, you know, when we talk about, you know, uh, you know, uh, design in fashion evolving, uh, you know, with the times, I think, so that's actually a manifestation of how this complex culture evolving with the times and constantly evolves. Yeah. So I think maybe, you know, when we talk about museum exhibition, we may, we may try to uh, adopt a more fluid or more, you know, discursive yeah. approach instead of, you know, like narrow it down and reducing it to something, you know, like, you know, the essential things, right? So I think that's my response to the question. <laughs> Right, right. I think there is, um, yeah, this is the, the last question. <laughs> this is the last question. Um, well, thank, thank you to uh, Charlin and Courtney for this interesting uh, dialogue on the evolving discourse about fashion as identity maker and its relevance in our past and present times, and also as um, curators and museum, how do we present this product as a consumption, as an object of consumption uh, in our current practices and also future 
practices. And I thank you for that. And also for our audience tonight, I thank you so much for uh, your questions to our panelists, wonderful questions. And we also have a feedback form uh, when we're closing. So we invite, we invite you to uh, submit your feedback form. And also, welcome to the Baba House. If you have not been to the Baba House, do visit us. Um, at the Baba House and take a look at Grocery's exhibition. We thank you for tonight. Please join us again next time. Thank you.